I'm standing on what is considered sacred ground by many Australians. This is the village of Kokoda on the northern slopes of the Owen Stanley mountain range in Papua New Guinea. The name Kokoda is significant to Australia because many Australians fought and died here in World War II. This village gave its name to a track that snakes its way for about 100 kilometers south from here to Owers Corner near Port Moresby, the capital of Papua New Guinea. The Kokoda Track or Trail is a narrow, precarious path that winds through some of the most inhospitable and isolated terrain on Earth. It crosses high rugged mountains, drops down into deep valleys and passes through fast flowing rivers. It cuts through dense jungle that's infested with snakes, leeches, mosquitoes and other nasty blood-sucking insects. The track is often drenched by tropical storms that make it wet, muddy, slippery and dangerous. It's really hard going. The steep gradients are demanding and exhausting. It was on the Kokoda track, under hellish conditions, that a small force of young, ill-equipped and undertrained Australians held off the Japanese army and stopped it from advancing along the track towards mainland Australia. The fighting was desperate and vicious. The Australian troops were wounded and exhausted beyond belief. But somehow, they always managed to find that extra bit of spirit to fight on, with the help of angels. Angels with black faces and frizzy hair. Local people that they affectionately called Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels because of their compassion, care and dedication. Their story will surprise you and inspire you. in December 1941. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, invaded the Malay Peninsula and bombed Singapore. After capturing Singapore in February 1942, they next planned to advance southeast and capture Port Moresby with a seaborne attack using their navy. However, their plans were disrupted when the American naval victories in the Battle of the Coral Sea in May and at midway in early June, broke the dominance of the Japanese Navy in the Pacific. But this setback didn't change Japan's plan. Their goal was still to establish a stronghold in Port Moresby. And if they couldn't do it through their Navy, then they'd do it through their army by marching overland along the Kokoda Track and across the Owen Stanley Ranges from here, the northern shore of Papua New Guinea. On the 21st of July, 1942, Japanese troops landed here in the Gona Sanananda area and established a beachhead. A full-scale offensive was soon underway as they moved south towards Port Moresby. The Kokoda campaign had begun. It consisted of a series of fierce battles fought along the Kokoda Track over four months between July and November 1942. The Australians were determined to stop the Japanese advance along the track and prevent them from establishing a base in Port Moresby that would threaten Australia and leave it isolated and vulnerable. Kokoda was a defining battle for Australia and perhaps the most significant campaign fought by Australians in World War II. More Australians died in the months fighting in Papua New Guinea than in any other campaign of the war. Conditions along the track were horrific. The terrain was steep and inhospitable. The rain was constant. The track was muddy, slippery and treacherous. Food and ammunition supplies were practically non-existent. 
The Australian troops were young, inexperienced and poorly equipped, and they constantly battled malaria and dysentery, as well as the Japanese. Australia's 39th Battalion, along with elements of the Papuan Infantry Battalion, were the first to engage the advancing Japanese in a series of short but critical encounters. They were part of the so-called Marubra Force. The 39th Battalion was under strength, consisting of only around 600 men, and many of them were 18 and 19-year-olds who were involved in battle for the very first time. The Japanese advanced southwards into the foothills of the Owen Stanley mountain range. And after a fierce battle against an Australian force that was outnumbered, outgunned and out-equipped, they captured the village of Kokoda along with its strategically vital airfield. From Kokoda, the Australians fell into a long fighting withdrawal along the track across the Owen Stanley range. They were determined to resist the Japanese advance as much as possible, ambushing, delaying, counter-attacking and frustrating the enemy as best they could. There were major battles at Ishurava, Mission Ridge and Brigade Hill, but the Japanese juggernaut continued its relentless advance southwards toward Port Moresby. The desperately tired but determined Australian forces kept continually defending, retreating and counter-attacking until they came to Imeter Ridge. Here, with Port Moresby virtually in sight, the Australians dug in to make a final stand. This ridge was the last natural defensive position before defeat. There was nowhere else to go. The time had come. The moment of destiny had arrived. The Japanese held the opposite ridge at Ioribawa. This was the final showdown. But now, the tables had turned. The Japanese were at the end of a long, desperately tiring march. Their supply lines were stretched to the limit. They were exhausted. And the Australians had one last ditch surprise for the Japanese. They had laboriously dragged 25-pounder guns up from Port Moresby. And suddenly, they opened fire on the Japanese positions. That was the turning point of the Kokoda campaign. The Australian shelling smashed the Japanese barricades. Iori Baiwa was as far as the Japanese advanced. From that time on, the Japanese began a long retreat back along the track to Kokoda and back to the sea, with the Australians pursuing them and attacking them the whole time. Now it was the turn of the Japanese to experience what the Australians had put up with during the preceding months. The Australians drove the Japanese back to Ghana and Sanananda and the northern shore of Papua New Guinea. And by the 22nd of January, 1943, all organised resistance by the Japanese in Papua New Guinea had ceased. In the fierce and desperate battles along the Kokoda Track, more than 600 Australians were killed and 1,600 wounded, with a further 4,000 casualties due to sickness and disease. But those figures would have been a lot higher and the outcome of the Kokoda campaign far different if it were not for the help of the local people who the Australians affectionately referred to as Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. During those gruelling days of the Kokoda campaign, thousands of local natives from along the track and further afield were employed as carriers or porters. They carried food, weapons, ammunition, equipment, supplies and medicines. In fact, all that was required for the war effort forward along the track to the front lines. They walked long distances with heavy loads. And then these brave and selfless men would turn around and carry the increasing number of sick and wounded back through the mud to safety, using stretchers or supporting and guiding those who could walk. 
These Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels were named for both their frizzy hair and their kind, helpful role. But they hadn't always had a caring and compassionate reputation. Most of the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels belonged to the Koyari tribe who lived in the villages along the Kokoda Track. Traditionally, the Koyari were a hostile and warlike people who had a reputation for bloodshed and violence. They were feared by the neighbouring tribes. But early in the 20th century, an amazing transformation took place. In 1908, the first Christian missionaries moved into the Koyari area and established the Bisia Tabu mission station near the entrance to the Kokoda Track. Under the leadership of Septimus Carr, they built schools and taught the people to read and write. They built medical clinics and shared the principles of health, hygiene and clean living. They built churches where the Christian message of grace, commandment keeping, temperance, peace and compassion was preached. Then in 1924, pioneer Seventh-day Adventist missionary William Locke and his family moved inland along the Kokoda Track to the village of Ifogi. There they set up a clinic and a mission school. And soon the Christian message of peace and kindness spread throughout the region and was embraced by the other villages along the Kokoda Track. The people had been transformed. Bloodshed and violence was replaced by peace and kindness. When the war came to the Kokoda Track villages in 1942, the changes that Christianity had made to the people's lives came through. The war had a devastating impact on the local people. Their villages were bombed, their homes burned, their gardens destroyed, their livestock shot. They were displaced. Yet through it all, they remained faithful to the Christian message of peace and compassion and loyal to the people who shared it with them. Historian Alan Smith highlights this. Every village along the Kokoda Trail had come under some measure of Adventist mission influence with baptised members in most villages. The Koyari had become so transformed that when the Japanese penetrated the area in their advance to Port Moresby, the Koyaris decided to remain loyal to their missionary friends. This view is confirmed by the descendants of the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels today. Many of them continue their family tradition of carrying supplies for Australians along the Kokoda Track. Only now, it's for the thousands of tourists who walk the track each year. My grandfather was the Fuzzy Wazi Enzor. His name is Lomola Melai. He came from the village of Kagi and uh, they helped the Australians by carrying their food, staffs, and the wounded people to the nearest clinic hospital to be treated. When the missionaries first came into Papua New Guinea, they started schools so that we can know how to read and write. And they also taught us how to live a better life. And then they also teach us how to li live and love each other like Jesus. So when they saw these wounded, they wanted to be like Jesus. That's the reason why they helped the wounded out of the, out of the jungles, back into uh, clinics and hospitals. My name is Peter Iga, and I've been working with the Koyari people and working for the Koyari people most of my life. When the war came, they had been Christians for some time now, and therefore they wanted to show that kind of love that they had about Jesus in the, from the missionary. The local people's positive attitude, respect and loyalty towards the Australian missionaries was transferred to the Australian troops. The Christian Koyari villages along the Kokoda Track saw the Australians as neighbours and natural allies and volunteered for the Allied cause. This is demonstrated by a report by Robin McCary, an Australian commando in this region. He said this. You had your loyal and your disloyal Papuans, without being in any way sectarian, 
We found that the Seventh-day Adventists were by far outstanding in loyalty. I know of not one Seventh-day Adventist adherent who was any way disloyal. I don't know what it is, but it just worked out that way. The other religions could be one way or the other, but the Seventh-day Adventists for some reason were particularly loyal and, well, they always were a cleaner people. They taught them cleanliness and respect and loyalty and cheerfulness. And you know, if you had to rely on a Papuan without knowing him or knowing the circumstances, the fact that he was a Seventh-day Adventist would swing you. This loyalty was also experienced by Lieutenant R.I. McElray. He was in a group of five Australian soldiers that was cut off behind enemy lines here near Manari village while out on patrol. They were in serious danger, but were found and guided to safety by local Christian villagers from Manari. Soon after their rescue, Lieutenant McElroy wrote a letter of appreciation. Dear Pastor Locke, I am writing this letter to you to tell you of the grand job done by the natives of your mission. During the recent activities against the Japanese here, I had the bad luck to be cut off with a patrol. Through the great assistance in every way by natives from your mission, we were able to get through to our side of things again. I felt sure that you would be interested to hear the good work of your people, who apparently have by your example and teachings reached the stage where they can teach us something of Christian ideals. Yours sincerely, R.W. McElroy. The positive influence of the Australian Christian missionaries, and the Locke family in particular, is one of the major reasons the Australian forces managed to get so many local native carriers in such a short space of time, and why the carriers worked so hard for so long in such atrocious conditions. In this terrible war without mercy, fought back and forth along kilometres of mountains, jungles and river crossings, with the Australian soldiers racked by hunger and disease and terrified of falling into enemy hands, the local people, the carriers, rose up and reached out to them with raw compassion and care. They are heroes who showed selflessness and courage in times of fear and hardship. And in particular, they displayed remarkable kindness and care, assisting wounded and sick Australian soldiers through the mud to safety. The Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels gained a reputation for dedication, gentleness and bravery that inspired Australian soldiers to send home poems and reports of their help along the muddy and treacherous track over the Owen Stanley Ranges. One of the most famous was a poem written by an Australian combat engineer, Bert Buros, called Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. Many a mother in Australia, when the busy day is done, sends a prayer to the Almighty for the keeping of her son, asking that an angel guide him and to bring him safely back. Now we see those prayers are answered on the Owen Stanley track. Though they haven't any halos, only holes slashed through the ear, and their faces marked with tattoos and with scratch pins in their hair, bringing back the badly wounded just as steady as a hearse, using leaves to keep the rain off, and as gentle as a nurse. Slow and careful in bad places, on the awful mountain track, and the look upon their faces makes us think that Christ was black. Not a move to hurt the carried, as they treat him like a saint. It's a picture worth recording that an artist's yet to paint. Many a lad will see their mother and the husband's weans and wives, just because the fuzzy wuzzies carried them to save their lives. From mortar or machine gun fire or chance surprise attack to safety and the care of doctors at the bottom of the track, may the mothers in Australia, when they offer up a prayer, mention these impromptu angels with fuzzy wuzzy hair. It's not surprising that when a mother back in Australia read these words, she was moved to write this touching response to the challenge in the poem. We, the mothers of Australia, as we kneel each night in prayer, will be sure to ask God's blessing on the men with fuzzy hair. And may the great creator who made both black and white help us remember how they helped to win the fight. 
for surely he has used these men with fuzzy hair to guard and watch our wounded with tender loving care. And perhaps when they are tired, with blistered aching back, he'll take their yoke upon himself and help them down the track. So we thank you, Fuzzy Wuzzy, for all that you have done, not only for Australia, but for every mother's son. And we're glad to call you friends, though your faces may be black, for we know that Christ walked with you on the Owen Stanley track. Another Australian soldier at the time expressed his gratitude to the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels this way. Believe me, when this war is over and it's history written, there is one chap that should get a large share of the praise. He is the Papuan. He sometimes arrives with bleeding shoulders, puts the wounded down gently, shakes himself, grins, and off he goes for another trip. Captain John McCarthy agreed with these sentiments of gratitude. He said, These men, so gentle and compassionate with men in pain, hold a justly honoured place in the esteem of every Australian. Paul Keating, the former Prime Minister of Australia, recognised the vital role of the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. At the 50th anniversary of the Kokoda campaign, he said, Above all, we should honour and express our profound admiration for the Papua New Guinean carriers whose stalwart support was crucial to the final victory. The support they gave to Australian soldiers, the terrible conditions and dangers they endured with the soldiers, the illness, injury and death many of them suffered constitutes one of the great human gestures of the war. Maybe the great humane gesture of our history. Yes, the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels became endeared to the Australian people because of the gentleness, kindness and care that they showed to sick and wounded Australians as they carried them to safety along the muddy and treacherous Kokoda Track. But they weren't always like that. Not long before, they were a warlike, bloodthirsty people. What changed them? What was it that turned violent warriors into fuzzy wuzzy angels of mercy. It was the Bible and the message of Jesus. They found joy and fulfillment in accepting Jesus and following his teachings. The transformation of individuals and tribes can be attributed to the Bible and one man, Jesus Christ. They were changed when they met Jesus Christ and let him guide their lives. Christianity and its message is still relevant today, and the Bible and its message still changes people today. That's why the Bible is called the living Word of God. It carries an amazing power with it wherever it goes, a power that changes lives, transforms character, gives strength to the weak, courage to the depressed, and hope to the dying. No one can read the Bible faithfully every day, without God's book changing them. And if you spend time each day reading the Bible, it will change you too. Jesus spent his time changing people. That's the heart of the Christian religion. And it's the heart of the Bible, the secret of its power. Jesus knew what power it was that changed people. Listen to what he said in John chapter eight and verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's truth that sets people free, that changes people. It's the truth that makes a drunkard a sober and loving father. It's truth that frees the drug abuser. It's the truth that transforms tempers and gives integrity and purpose in life. Millions of lives have been changed as people have studied the Bible. No greater power exists in the world to touch hearts and change lives. If you'd like to get closer to God, live a better life, and find true peace and happiness, 
then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's the book, Secrets of True Greatness. This book is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. Thousands have been blessed and inspired by this book, Secrets of True Greatness. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive the gift we have for you today. Here's the information you need. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or 770 800 0266 in the United States or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. You can also write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia, or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand, or PO Box 888717, Atlanta, Georgia, 30356, USA. You can also email us at info at tij.tv. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed today's journey to Papua New Guinea and along the Kokoda Track and our reflections on the Bible and its power to change lives for the better and bring joy and happiness, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, let's pray for God's leading and guidance in our lives. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word, the Bible. We want to experience the power, the life-changing power that's in the Bible. We'd like You to begin changing us. Today and every day from now on, we want to surrender our lives to You. We want to learn to live our lives in Your love and be filled with Your love and compassion. Help us to accept others just as you've accepted us. Help us to love others unconditionally, just as you've loved us. Help us to forgive others totally, just as you've forgiven us. And help us to value others as much as you value us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.